difference in meaning in their scholarship, uh, Professor Dr. Norm Chomsky. Uh, most of my academic life, I've had the opportunity to hear him from distance, and it's an absolute privilege for me to personally be present here and to formally introduce uh, Professor Norm Chomsky. Uh, I also must say that uh, uh, one of the remarkable uh, you know, aspects of his work is the fact that he inspired individuals and continued to inspire individuals and institutions from around the world. He quintessentially epitomizes uh, the idea of a, a public scholar, a, a true public intellectual, who has spent his entire life speaking truth to power and in that process inspired generations of young people, many of whom have acknowledged that as they have received the Star Scholars Award today. Uh, Professor Chomsky is a distinguished keynote speaker of the STAR 2021 Global Conference. He has uh, received several awards and um, he's been a very distinguished scholar. He's currently the Laureate Professor of Linguistics and Agnes Nem Howry Chair at the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Arizona. Uh, all of you should already know he is considered as the founder of modern linguistics and is one of the most cited scholars across various disciplines. Professor Chomsky introduced the concept of universal grammar, which underlies all human speech and is based in the innate structure of the mind and the brain. Chomsky has not only transformed the field of linguistics, but his work has also influenced a number of other fields such as cognitive science, philosophy, psychology, computer science, mathematics, childhood education, and anthropology. For those of us who are in the field of law and justice, he has also influenced our own disciplines. And today is very, very special because today is also the Human Rights Day. As an academic, Dr. Chomsky has received numerous awards, including the Kyoto Prize in Basic Sciences, the uh, Helmholtz Medal, and the Ben Franklin Medal in Computer and Cognitive Science. But Chomsky is also engaged in public intellectual and activist work, which has indeed uh, inspired millions to continue the pursuit of justice in all its forms and manifestations. If we would like to reflect on the concept of higher education for the greater good, leadership and institutional resilience and look for uh, an inspiring uh, global public intellectual, Professor Chomsky is a good example to demonstrate how he has combined serious academic research with public dissemination of knowledge and activism for common good throughout his life and career. Without further ado, I would now like to invite Professor Norm Chomsky to deliver his keynote address on the theme of this year's conference. Over to you, Professor Chomsky. Well, I would like to begin by congratulating the recipients of these awards for truly impressive achievements, a uh, great promise of exciting contributions ahead. Would like to welcome you all to the Star Scholars Network, an organization which has offers great hope for the future with its internationalism and its impressive contributions. Uh, we are meeting at uh, a unique moment of human history. Uh, might be close to a terminal moment of human history. Not an idle concern, by no means inevitable. Uh, perhaps I can start with something that may seem remote. You, I'm sure, know about the famous Fermi paradox posed by the great physicist Enrico Fermi. In brief, where are they? His discipline of astrophysics demonstrates that there are a vast number of planets accessible to us with conditions similar enough to Earth so that they should be able to support life over time intelligent life, perhaps even super intelligent life. So where are they? With the most diligent search 
uh, we cannot find the slightest hint of their existence. Well, one answer that's been offered uh, is that intelligent life has indeed developed maybe many times, but proved to be a lethal mutation and quickly destroyed itself. We know of only one case, humans on earth. We are a very new species, only a few hundred thousand years old. It's a blink of an eye in evolutionary time. And we seem to be intent on establishing this grim thesis. There has been reason for such suspicions since August 1945, when we learned that human intelligence had devised the means for self-annihilation, a day that's very vivid in my memory. Well, it hadn't quite each reached that peak or perhaps depths yet at that point, but it was clear that the day was not far off. Technological developments would reach that point. And they did a few years later in 1953, when the United States and the Soviet Union exploded thermonuclear weapons, uh, which can indeed carry out total annihilation. Well, in acknowledgement of this achievement of human intelligence, the hands of the famous doomsday clock, which encapsulates the world security situation, the hands were advanced to two minutes to midnight. Midnight means termination. Uh, the hands of the doomsday clock have oscillated since then as world circumstances varied. Uh, they did not reach two minutes to midnight again until quite recently, halfway through the Trump administration. In its final years, the Analysts abandoned minutes altogether, shifted to seconds. Now the last setting of the clock, 100 seconds to midnight. It will be set again in a few weeks. I wouldn't be surprised if it moves closer to midnight. Well, let's take a closer look. We are currently facing a confluence of very serious crises. It's important to be aware of the fact that to each of these crises, we know of feasible solutions, which could not only overcome the crises, but also open the door to a much better world, a much more livable world, world of much greater freedom and justice. Nevertheless, in each of these cases, we are rejecting the solutions and racing to a precipice, some of us more rapidly than others. To be more precise, it is not we who are racing to the precipice. Rather, it is those who Adam Smith called the masters of mankind. In his day, he was referring to the merchants and manufacturers of England. In our day, multinational corporations, financial institutions, other concentrations of private power, and governments that in no small measure are at their service. On the matter of service to the masters, uh, evidence is compelling. It was compelling to Adam Smith 250 years ago. He pointed out that the masters of mankind make sure to use their power to control governments and to ensure that public policies 
will be to their benefit, in Smith's words, that their own interests are most peculiarly attended to, however grievous the effect on others, including the people of England, but much worse, the victims of what he called the savage justice of the Europeans, referring specifically to British crimes in India, which were by no means yet reaching their horrendous peak in his day. Well, from his day to ours, evidence has remained compelling. Uh, illustrative cases are regularly on the front pages right now, in fact. As I'm sure you know, the U.S. Congress is now debating a major program, which, among other things, may be the last chance for the United States to take serious steps to arrest uh, catastrophic global warming. The fate of the, the Republican Party, which is half the Congress, is 100% opposed to denialist party. Anything to do with global warming, they want to stop in its tracks right away. So the fate of the measure is in the hands of a Democrat, Joe Manchin, chairman of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. His official position, in his words, is innovation, but no elimination. In other words, no reduction of the use of fossil fuels. We should devote efforts to innovation, which maybe someday will develop no unknown technology that might remove from the atmosphere the poisons that we are pouring into it in the interests of short-term profit for the masters of mankind. Well, this slogan, innovation but no elimination, comes straight from the public relations department of ExxonMobil, leading U.S. fossil fuel industry, and its other and others like it. And if the denialist party returns to power next year, as it very well may, we will be back to racing towards the abyss as quickly as possible, picking up from the disastrous Trump years. Well, blocking of legislation that would harm the fossil fuel industry is not a malady specific to the United States. Let's consider what's happening right now as we meet. As we meet, governments of the world are pressuring oil producers to increase production. They have just been advised in the August IPCC report, by far the most dire yet, they've been advised that catastrophe is looming unless we begin immediately to reduce fossil fuel use year by year, effectively phasing it out by mid-century. Well, in the wake of that warning, petroleum industry journals are euphoric about the discovery of new fields to exploit as demand for oil increases. Uh, the business press soberly debates whether the U.S. fracking industry or the oil cartel OPEC is best place to increase production. That's one hand. The other hand is the warning that we must terminate fossil fuel use beginning immediately, certain percentage each year, till it's phased out within a few decades. Well, as you know, there was just an important 
meeting in Glasgow, uh, COP26, International Conference on Global Warming and what to do about it. Actually, at Glasgow, there were two events. One event took place within the stately halls, uh, distinguished men and women uh, discussing, debating, uh, not what to do, but how to not do anything. In fact, the major conclusion that they reached was, let's meet again to next year while the world burns, and maybe we'll be able to figure something out then. Actually, the proposals that were made are worth looking into closely. Uh, you may have noticed that the American negotiator, John Kerry, at one point was euphoric about the fact that we have now passed a major milestone the market is on our side. Major investors have joined us in committing themselves to solve this existential problem. Uh, he was referring to an announcement by the CEO of Blackstone, one of the great investment firms, saying that investors had gotten together, community investors, and had agreed to put $130 trillion to work to overcome global warming. With $130 trillion and the market on our side, how can we lose? Until we look at the footnotes. You look at the small print, turns out, yes, they're willing to put $130 trillion into this effort as long as two conditions are met. One, the investments are profitable to them, and two, they're guaranteed against risk. The IMF will give a guarantee that if there's any loss, they're compensated. So the investor community is willing to join as long as they can make a lot of money and face no risk because the public will ensure that any that to assume any risk that might take place. So that's the great news. Uh, well, there was another event at Glasgow in the streets. Tens of thousands of people, mostly young people, were demonstrating, demanding that those inside take the measures that they know are available uh, to address this looming crisis and to open the way to a world in which young people and their children can survive and move on to further progress. That was outside. Uh, which of these two events prevails will determine the future of the human species and the huge number of other species that we are wantonly destroying in our mad race, the mad race of the masters for greater profit and power while there's still time. Well, this is not the first time that humanity has faced severe threats, though now Never before have the threats been so dire as at the present moment. And we can learn something by looking at past somewhat similar experiences. Uh, one of them was 90 years ago. Happened to be my childhood. Remember it very well. The world was facing very serious crises. The depression of the 1930s was extreme. Poverty was far worse than today. Uh, there were several ways to escape the crisis. Continental Europe picked one of those ways. Fascism, Nazism, the depths of human history. In the United States, a different way was chosen. 
a militant working class, sympathetic president turned to social democracy. Post-war Europe moved in the same direction. That led to what economists call the golden age of capitalism, 1950s, 1960s, highest growth rate ever, egalitarian growth, lowest quintile, did as well as the highest quintile of great progress, many flaws, uh, but from an economic point of view, a remarkable achievement. Well, the, the masters of the universe, they objected, they resisted. But until the 1970s, they were unable to reverse the course. By the late 1970s, the business offensive was making progress. It was the progress that was made was captured eloquently in 1978 by the president of the United Auto Workers Union. He uh, resigned from a business labor committee commission that President Carter had established. And in resigning, he, he issued a statement, which I'll quote, uh, it captures very well the transition from the golden age to the neoliberal period that followed. He said he condemned the masters, the business leaders, for having chosen to wage a one-sided class war, a war against working people, the unemployed, the poor, the minorities, the very young, the very old, and the many in the middle class of our society. And having broken and discarded the fragile, unwritten compact previously existing during a period of growth and progress, the New Deal years, the Golden Age. That was 1978. Shortly after, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher took office uh, the one-sided class war took off full steam. Their first acts, both of them, were to smash unions using illegal methods, permanent replacement workers, scabs, uh, opening the door to the corporate sector to follow suit. They and their advisors understood that it was imperative to deprive working people of their main means of defense against what was to come. Well, for those with eyes open, what was to come was never in doubt. Uh, you may recall Ronald Reagan's inaugural address, 1981, which the main theme was captured in his phrase, government is the problem not the solution. Well, if government isn't making the decisions, the decisions don't disappear. They move somewhere else. They move from government, which is partially accountable to the population, to concentrated private power, which is totally unaccountable to the population. That's the shift of decision-making about the nature of the society and how those decisions should be made was explained at the same time by the economic guru of the neoliberal movement, Milton Friedman, came out with an important article in which he said that corporations have a single responsibility to enrich themselves and to enrich the management to incorporate is actually a gift from the public. It confers many advantages that the public offers if you incorporate. But according to the doctrine, uh, that gift uh, imposes no responsibilities. Your only responsibility is self-enrichment. So put it all together. 
uh, decisions shift from government, partially accountable to the population, to private concentrations of power, which have the sole responsibility of self-enrichment. So it didn't take a genius to imagine what was going to happen over the next 40 years. And we now have some estimates of it from high-level sources. Uh, recently, the highly regarded Rand Corporation, a quasi-governmental, highly respected, did analysis of what they call the transfer of wealth from the lower 90% of the population, the working class, the middle class, the poor, lower 90% in income, the transfer of wealth from them to the very top, to 1%, even a fraction of 1% over the past 40 years. Their estimate is about $50 trillion, not small change, over 40 years. That's actually an underestimate, doesn't take into account many other devices that were used in what amounts to highway robbery of the general public, leading to unparalleled inequality, concentration of power and wealth. For most of the population majority, it's meant stagnation, uh, real will, male wages in the United States for non-supervisory workers are actually less than they were in 1979. For most people, it's a precarious existence, uh, paycheck to paycheck, very little uh, reserve in case of any emergency. Meanwhile, social uh, welfare, social services have been undermined, not just in the United States, everywhere the neoliberal plague has attacked the population. Uh, the term, the claim is uh, that this is a turn to markets. It's what you see if you look it up in the dictionary. It's not what it is. It's class war. It's what economists have called a bailout economy. As soon as this uh, neoliberal assault began, it was an enormous growth of financial institutions. They had been carefully regulated before, so no major crises. As soon as the Reagan administration began, financial crises came with it, each one worse than the last. Each one led to a public bailout. It's been called by economists a bailout economy. Uh, in fact, the International Monetary Fund did a study in which they estimated that the profits of major human U.S. banks come primarily from the understanding that they will be bailed out if they get into trouble, meaning the banks get cheap credit, uh, can uh, access to easy money, uh, they can make risky investments which are profitable, knowing that if anything goes wrong, the taxpayer will pay for it, gives them huge profits. That's the bailout economy. This is one-sided class war. Working people and the poor are indeed thrown into the market. They are to suffer the ravages of the market, survive if you can. The masters are protected by a powerful state as in the radically protectionist arrangements that are ludicrously called free trade agreements. One of the reasons today why the processes to produce vaccines are not made available to the developing world, which could bring to an end the raging pandemic, prevent the mutations which are leading to new and more dangerous variants, but you have to protect them. Same with Thatcher. Her mantra was, there is no society. You survive somehow on your own, unless, of course, you're among the masters. Then there's a rich society. 
not only the government that you largely control, but chambers of commerce, business roundtable, trade associations, and more. So a rich uh, society to protect you. And the consequences have been profound, quite apart from the vast robbery of the public. The assault has engendered anger, resentment, conspiracy theories about hidden powers causing your malaise, uh, anti-vax movements, a lot more. It's also created fertile terrain for demagogues of the Trump variety who can hold up a banner with one hand saying, I'm your protector, I love you, while stabbing you in the back with the other. Uh, during the Trump administration, there was one legislative achievement, the tax bill of 2017, what economist Joseph Stiglitz called the donor relief bill of 2017, a vast gift to the super rich in the corporate sector, stabbing everyone else in the back. At the same time, there are very visible steps towards proto-fascism, actually all the way, some analysts argue, very sober, highly respected voices are sounding the alarm about the collapse of American democracy with dire consequences for the world. Among them, leading commentators of the London Financial Times, world's leading business press, who warn that the United States is being driven to autocracy by a radical party with a reactionary agenda, which actually ranks alongside the far right European parties with neo-fascist origins. Well, that's a bird's eye view of where I think we are now. Uh, it's not graven in stone, plenty of counter forces on climate, mainly the young, terrible indictment of my generation when Greta Thunberg told the Assembly of the Masters at Davos, Switzerland, that you have betrayed us. She was right. The words should be seared in our conscious conscience. It's not too late, but we don't have much time to hear these words, to heed these words. Well, there are, there's no time to talk about it. There are dangerous steps all around the world to escalate con con uh, conflict, leading to very serious, threatening conflicts. All of this takes place against a background that's plain and stark. The US inherited the mantle of global dominance from Britain, substantially extending its reach. China's a rising power. It's bound to pay, play a major role in world affairs. The crises that we face are all international. Pandemics, destruction of the environment, no, no borders, nor does nuclear war. The US and China will either cooperate in addressing these crises or we are doomed. Cooperation is certainly achievable, just as in the other crises we face, which have solutions that are within reach. The question we face is whether we have the will, we have the moral intelligence to save ourselves from cataclysms that our technical intelligence has created, or whether we will choose to show that higher intelligence really may be a lethal mutation, providing an unhappy answer to Fermi's paradox. The answers to these grim questions are in your hands.
Good luck in dealing with them. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. Everyone, please unmute yourself and clap your hands and let's sing happy birthday to Professor Chomsky. <laughs> happy birthday, birthday to, to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, birthday to you, Professor Chomsky. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. That's beautiful. Blow the candles out on a virtual cake. <laughs>